Every three years since 2001, the prestigious John Art Museum on the campus of Gonzaga University has played host to an extraordinary art exhibit. Extraordinary not just because it draws in some of the area's more accomplished artists, or the fact that it's the Junt's most anticipated and popular art show. No, what makes this art exhibit titled Drawn to the Wall so compelling is the intriguing concept behind it. It started with the idea of, of uh, Scott Patnote, who is the uh, director, curator for the museum. He was inspired by a video that he'd seen of Jim Dine, who's a very well-known artist and especially known for his drawing using charcoal. And in this video, it shows Jim Dine actually drawing on the walls of what was an old church. And he spends eight days drawing on those walls. And then at the end of those eight days, there's an exhibition. And then when that's finished, the walls are painted over. It's really, really inspirational. So ours is really sort of a variation on that. In many ways, the Drawn to the Wall exhibit is art in the extreme. For it requires five participating artists to create within a confined space a short-lived, large-scale drawing using limited materials in just two weeks. It's precisely these narrow guidelines that distinguish this art exhibit from all the rest. It's pretty exciting for them because even though these are artists who've been working are very well known around the area, they're used to having deadlines and they're used to even sometimes large-scale projects. Um, they're not used to having those two things be so closely linked and they're also not used to working with a group. Ultimately, the success of any art show begins and ends with the creative talent involved. In this case, it was apparent from the start. The 2010 version of Drawn to the Wall was in good hands. I'm Louise Cotis. I have been an artist my whole life. I remember beginning to work with fabrics when I was five years old, making doll clothes, as you might imagine. I knew a moment after I read the letter of invitation what I would make. My inspiration came from the sticks that I played with on the farm where I grew up and also all the leaves that are in my own garden. So I used twigs, I used the silks that I enjoy working with, I used a contemporary material of acrylic rod. Um, I am so accustomed to doing commission work for spaces of all different sizes and scales that I wasn't particularly um, confounded by an eight by 11 foot wall. The only hard part was, oh, I'm going to make these three-dimensional things, how can I attach them so it will look confident? I came with a plan, and the pieces at the high top are bigger than those closer to the floor. My interpretation of my work came after I had finished it, and then I knew what I was talking about in the piece. Ah, leaf dance on a grid. I'm Gordon Wilson. I, uh, I'm a professor of art here at uh, Whitworth University, and I, I hadn't seen in any of the exhibits before where there was a human figure that took up the whole space. Uh, so that, to me, was important, was to, to do something that wasn't like what I'd seen before. Um, when I started to draw on the wall, as soon as I ran the material in the wall and saw those bumps, I didn't really like it. But I did like that it was resistant. Um, for me, that was probably the most difficult thing, because I'm really picky about what I draw on and what I paint on. Of course, the scale, one of the big things I found is that I'd work on uh, the piece and it was very, very difficult to tell what it looked like, so up and down the ladder a lot, getting back, see what it looks like from a distance. I was trying to think of a title for the piece, and I couldn't think of any title that, for me, would be helpful to the viewer. There was a, an initial meaning of the image for me, but as I worked on it, it had a lot of different meanings, and, I'd, and that's one of the reasons that I made the change from being completely a skeleton, and then eventually tipping the, that one plane, which I didn't do initially when I was, was working on it. So I'm hoping that it will make people think and that they will find some kind of meaning that's uh, valuable for them. I'm Carolyn Stevens, and I've been a practicing artist for 35 years plus. So I was excited when I was invited mostly because drawing is probably the most substantial element that interested me. But the wall itself, its bigness, its verticality, that remained challenging from the start to the very end. In a way, as I might do in a lecture, I prepare enough that I am prepared to approach the process, but I never like to be so prepared that I'm working by rote. 
I knew I was going to use imagery, but I had a range of images, so I let the process, including my choice of imagery, evolve as the working time began. I gave a title to my piece, I called it The Imposition of Order. It seems as if the title should suggest that some outside forces have imposed order. But in terms of another way of seeing where I was going, I thought about how it is that we learn about our world. And particularly in this piece, I included some things that speak to not my profession, but my husband's profession. So he was trained in the natural sciences, where finding and using systems of order are really important. And I think most viewers will find a certain quiet, a calming mood in the piece. My name is Ken Spearing. I've um, been in art uh, most of my life. I can remember starting in the third grade with oil paints, and here I am still doing it. My piece arose from sort of a love of place. Um, I grew up in Wyoming, and my father and mother would always find time to take the family either camping or fishing in this area in the Clarks Fork Canyon. And in this case, um, I decided to try to paint the um, emotional glow behind it rather than be too concerned about the accuracy to the landscape. So I manipulated to a deeper perspective vertically and I shied away from using charcoal thinking I would do some underpainting with the, the uh, acrylics so you could have a rough surface or a smooth surface and the acrylic being airbrushed on is going to cover it fairly evenly. It was a beautiful surface then to work subsequently with um, the Prismacolor pencils. Uh, pencils seemed a little minuscule compared to the scale of the wall, so you know there was a certain amount of time spent covering square footage. You know, polishing it is where the challenge was, is finishing it. Was I satisfied with it? Yes, I, I am. You know, it uh, was to be a drawing, which in, it can be a complete piece of art, and I took this one to a level of completion. We had, you know, the inclusion of that uh, moment when a young couple um, discovers each other on a nice summer evening, you know, in this case probably idealized with a 1956 Chrysler convertible at the brink of a precipice. And so hence the title, The Topography of Romance. My name is Michael Horswell. I'm a um, mixed media sculptor. I've been doing art, uh, uh, working artist for about 25 years. You know, the invitation was terrific from Karen and Scott. It was just, I mean, the opportunity to work at that scale um, and in the June uh, was just uh, something I couldn't pass up. I think the biggest challenge I felt was preparing for it, was thinking about how am I going to take a drawing that I do in a relatively small scale and make it that large. The other issue with the verticality at that size is the fact that viewers, when they come to see it, will be, they're going to be looking up at the piece. So that was the other issue, was to try to figure out how to compose something so that when people were looking at it straight on and then looking up, you didn't lose the, the effects and the power of the top of the, of the composition. So that was something that I hadn't really anticipated fully until I got there and then really realized the size of the wall. But as it turned out, it, it turned out to be not as difficult as I thought. The issues of, of kind of understanding the texture of the walls and how the charcoal the materials would work with the walls and how the erasers would work with the walls, that was, that was probably the other aspect of it that was hard to, to foresee. But there's something about charcoal that's really lovely, it's forgiving, and it's, it really works with you. What I discovered in, in doing this was that because of its size, uh, it allowed me to really play a lot more with detail of the, this imagined space that I, that I created that I hadn't thought I would, would do. The piece is entitled The Evolution of Good Intentions. It's kind of about what we do, I think, as a species in terms of trying to navigate this really this powerful natural world that we, we live in and, and try to control to some degree. My hope is that when people look at it, they will bring their own interpretation of what it is to how they view the piece. Gonzaga University professor Tony Osborne describes Drawn to the Wall as a paradox. For it uses walls to clear away falsely imposed barriers between our perceptions of ephemeral and permanent, freedom and restriction, creation and destruction. In the end, it's the acceptance of this paradox that allows the artists of Drawn to the Wall to willingly embrace the exhibit's final act, whitewashing their inspired work. I think it, uh, it adds an element of uh, not debasement, but 
um, making art real. You know, we tend to want to make something beautiful, put it on a pedestal, frame it, and hope that it lives on forever. And in some respects, uh, nothing is permanent. Um, to be reminded of that is not a bad thing on occasion. Fortunately for the artists of Drawn to the Wall 4, while the physical evidence of their artistry was now gone, the memory of what was a shared creative experience unlike any other is one certain to last a lifetime. That's the other thing I wanted to say about this thing. I've never had that much fun before making art, I think. That's one of the, one of the things I definitely got out of it. It's pure joy. <laughs>